Hello and welcome. Hey, so today we're going to be talking about games in the classroom going from concept all the way through to execution. We're going to be taking a look at some of the theoretical underpinnings for why you might want to use uh, games or simulations in the classroom and in other learning and training environments. And we're going to talk about some best practices and success stories along the way. This should take us about an hour, maybe a little longer. Uh, it's not like I got a hold for questions since we're doing this all online, but would love to get some interaction from you. Uh, down the line, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So, what's happening today? Uh, we're going to cover who am I, just a brief introduction to why you should even listen to me. We're going to talk about what we're doing, look at the theoretical approaches that are underlying the kinds of ideas we're going to throw out there, and then we're going to look at those practical examples. So, who am I? Hi, I'm Brant. I'm a game designer, done stuff on the professional level, with both Harnessed Electrons and Oberon Associates. I've done stuff for the National Defense University, for the National Security Agency, and a couple other folks out there in DOD land and in the national security space. I've also done commercial game design, both role-playing and tabletop stuff for Bayonet Games. And I've done some simulation training design for the Ohio Department of Health when I was in grad school at Ohio State. So I've done this uh, from an academic perspective, a commercial perspective, and a professional perspective. I've also been a seminar leader at both the Connections Game Conference and at the Origins War College. The Origins War College is a commercial game convention in Columbus, Ohio every year. For those of you that don't know about it, uh, while it's primarily commercial focused, lots of games, tournaments, playing, huge exhibit hall, great time had by everyone, the Origins War College is a speaker track for educational programming that is focused on uh, historical military defense national security sorts of topics. And in the past, we've also had a variety of panel discussions and seminars where I was either the leader or the moderator on the panel, in addition to giving some talks very similar to this one. The Connections Game Conference is a professional game conference that brings together a lot of the defense and national security practitioners, along with academics and commercial designers that are very focused on the practical uses of gaming in general and wargaming specifically in the defense and national security space. I've been a game writer and reviewer in the gaming media world for over 20 years now, uh, both role-playing and tabletop, as well as some digital stuff. I've been a podcast host, an editor, a writer, a reviewer, a columnist. I've done video, I do video casts, video blogs, whatever you want to call them. I've run my own sites for quite a while. So I've been very heavily involved in the gaming community a lot over you know the 40 years I've been playing games, but also over the last 20 years I've been involved in those online communities. And then, uh, perhaps most important for the context today, I've been an instructor at the college level at Ohio State, at William Peace University, at Wake Tech, the University of South Carolina, a couple other places. I just ran out of space on here to, to count them all. So what are we doing? We're going to discuss some games in the classroom we've already mentioned. We're going to look at theoretical examples, practical examples, theoretical breakdowns, practical examples, and then we're going to talk about some ideas moving forward. I want to get some definitions out of the way. And I, I don't want to start a, a, an epistemological war about these definitions or anything. I want to make sure that we're clear on the way we're using these terms in today's presentation. And that's the key thing. I don't care how you use these things outside the presentation, but for the purposes of today, this is the focus that we're looking at. Learning versus training, we're going to differentiate between new skill acquisition and existing skill rehearsal. Games and sims are going to differentiate slightly here with games being inherently competitive exercises. These have winners and losers. We're keeping score. Whereas simulations are looking at some sort of reflection of a real world phenomenon that we're going to be trying to model. So let's dig into these a little deeper. For learning, for today's discussion, and again, I'm not trying to start a definitional war or anything. For today's discussion, we're using the term learning as focusing on the acquisition of a new skill. I don't already know how to do this. I'm figuring out how to do this. It's the first time people are using this skill, whether it's a new concept, new vocabulary, new processes, but especially concepts, vocabulary, how to do something. Um, Vocabulary is very important. This is something that when we learn a new language, we are learning the just the parts of speech, just what are those words in the other language, as an example. And when we talk about another language, we're not just talking about German or French or Japanese. We're also talking about 
the specific language of an industry or a particular knowledge domain. How many folks working in the medical field have heard certain terms and language used in the medical field that's very different than what you find in IT, that's very different than what you find in architecture? Training. For today's discussion, we're looking at the rehearsal and refinement of existing skills. So this isn't the first time I've used it. This isn't the first time I've done something. And I am I'm practicing that skill over and over. I may be practicing that skill in conjunction with others, but these are skills that I've already used. All right, let's talk about games real quick. This is something very important. Games do not inherently involve power chords. They might, but they don't need to. And this is something that any academics listening to this are probably going to have a hard time grappling with because in the academic world, Game research exists very heavily as an outgrowth of old media effects research from the 50s and 60s and 70s where they were uh, the, the academics were exploring the effects of television on audiences and then video games grew out of that as, oh, hey, now you're plugging something into a TV. Let's interact with that. Okay, what kind of media effects do we have with that? And it has evolved at, with video game research and part of the reason, quite frankly, is there's a lot of money in that. But... Games do not have to involve power chords. And the board game world out there is saying, well, duh. But you'd be amazed at how many times you get into game discussions with folks when we're talking about learning, training, uh, interactivity environments, and everybody immediately assumes a power chord. There was actually a discussion one time with an academic panel that they were giving their presentations on the uses of games and something or other. And during the Q&A at the end, I was able to get, you know, get recognized by the chair. And I asked the question, I said, you know, everybody up there, all of you guys on that stage are talking about games. And every one of you is talking about digital games. Everything's got to involve a power cord. What about non-digital games, things you don't have to play on a computer? And they look completely perplexed. And, and one of them finally said, well, give me an example. I said, well, chess. Like, you can play chess without the, you know, two guys, table, move some pieces around. And the guy just sort of shrugged and said, well, you can play chess on the computer and completely dismissed the question and moved on to somebody else. Uh, that's typical of an academic mindset, quite frankly, in, in a lot of the world, that they don't care about talking about games unless it involves uh, a power chord. That is not what we're going to do today. Today, the games we're talking about, and you'll see some practical examples later, do not inherently involve power chords, and that's totally okay. So games, they are inherently competitive exercises. Right? There is a scorekeeping mechanism involved in a game. And, and so when we're talking about a game, there, there needs to be a way to decide winners and losers or ties. Like if there's a tie, that's fine. But we've got, we've got some sort of uh, evaluation criteria that decides winners and losers. The other key thing involved in this with a game is that we need to look at the necessity of participant choice in the game. The participants have to be able to make decisions in the game that affect the, 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 the follow-on actions in the game. If the participant's choice exists in, only in whether or not to play, it's not a game. And the example of that, that that's a real-world example, is the game Candyland. Like, look, two, three years old, you get out Candyland, you stack the cards up, you flip the card over, you move your dude to the color that's on the card. Like, we all get it. It's a fun activity for two- and three- and four-year-olds to do with older siblings or parents or grandparents. They're having a good time. They're doing something fun with the family. And that's cool, but it's not a game because there's no choice. Right? You flip the card over, you go where the card tells you to go, and your only choice is whether or not to keep flipping cards. There's no real choice in there. The other thing that, that's important in all this is the idea of a scorekeeping mechanism. And we're going to see that here in a few minutes, the, the differentiation between games and, like, a toy or something. <clears throat> simulations are attempting to model or replicate some facets of reality. And so there's no requirement for scorekeeping there. If you think about a flight simulator, you can take off of the plane, you can fly around if you're doing a military flight simulator, or you can drop some bombs on somebody or whatever, but, but you can fly around, tour some airports, but there's no inherent scorekeeping in just flying around and, you know, landing at airports and taking off and banking and, you know, go barnstorming, whatever you want to do. It's when you graft some sort of scorekeeping mechanism on it that it now moves into the world of a game. And, and these sorts of pedantic differences are very important for today's discussions because you're going to see that these theoretical underpinnings help us match 
what we're trying to accomplish with the tools we're going to use to accomplish them. And so simulations may not even require a participant. I can set up a trained simulation that tries to figure out based on loads and fuel sources and water sources and how much of what kind of cargo I can move from place to place with what kinds of engines and what kind of time. And I can turn it on and just sort of let it go. And I don't even have to play along. I can just watch it happen. And that, that can be a useful tool for gaining insights into certain things. But it's not a game because we're not keeping score and there's no participant choice in those things. All right, so to reiterate, for today, learning, we're talking about new skill acquisition, whereas training, we're talking about skills you already have. Games are inherently competitive exercise. we got to keep score, and the participants have to have some choices in there. It can't be something that's just on rails. Whereas a simulation can be on rails, and that's fine. What we're looking at with simulations is what level and detail of reality are we trying to model and reflect in our tools. And as a note about that, Greg Kostikian, great game theorist, commercial game designer, been around forever, uh, has noted, according to Will Wright, SimCity is not a game but a toy. And the comparison he uses is a ball. right? You can bounce it, twirl it, throw it, dribble it. That's fine. It's still just a toy. It's not until you use it in a game like soccer or basketball, those player-defined objectives, that it becomes a game. Otherwise, you're playing catch. Of note, there are a variety of different theoretical approaches to defining and describing games. Kostikian is one of them. Prinsky is one of them. Asgari is one of them. There's a bunch of these. This isn't the universe of theoretical approaches to games. I'm only throwing this in here really to show you that there are some very different ideas about what counts as a game. We're boiling it down to a couple of very simple things. Scorekeeping and choice. And that's really what we're focused on when we're describing games on, on our end. The... There are plenty of theoretical examples you can go find beyond these three, and that's cool. This is really to show you that there's lots of different ideas about, the, uh, about it. All right, so how do games and simulations interact and overlap? Games are inherently competitive or non-competitive. Like, games are inherently competitive. Non-competitive ones aren't really games. Simulations are levels of reflection of reality, and so these two things really are perpendicular to each other. They're not an either-or. You can have, in that top left corner, games that are simulations. You can lay scorekeeping mechanisms over top of very detailed tools that put a game and a simulation in the same box. And that's totally fine. Like that, That's you know a very complex game, but those things do exist. Simulations can be non-competitive, like a flight simulator. Games can be very abstract. And an example of moving from more abstract to more realistic in the case of games moving up that simulation continuum, so from the bottom of our chart moving up, tic-tac-toe is a game of area control. You alternate turns. The only thing you need to do to take control of that area is put your mark in it. All of the areas are of equal size and equal importance to the game. As we move up slightly in the level of complexity, tic-tac-toe... Is, is a game of area control. So is risk. It is attempting to take controls of areas. However, we've now got a couple of things that are slightly more realistic. The more territory you control, the more tokens you can produce, right? The more armies you can churn out for the purpose of taking control of more territory. We are now using a map that is reflective of primarily the world for the normal game of risk, but there's, you know, risk Europe and castle risk and whatever. We're focused on regular old risk, you've got the world out there. And so now you've got geographical spatial differences that you've got to navigate from one place to another. You've got some places where the territories are tightly clustered together, others where they're very spread out. You may have sea lanes that control access to certain areas. And so we're getting a little more realistic because spatial differentiation is a big deal. Production can be a big deal relative to just everybody gets an X or an O and put them in your spaces. But then we go up a level from risk, and we go up to, say, Axis and Allies, those board games. Now, your production is a little more realistic than just turn in some matched cards and get more armies. Now you have to build factories to turn out armies. And are you going to invest some of your money into building more factories or just turning out more armies? 
you now have a differentiation not just between regular armies but more experienced troops or better equipped troops you now have fleets in the water you have aircraft overhead and so there's differentiation among the different kinds of units and so we've gone from a very abstract tic-tac-toe everyone is evenly balanced except that x goes first on a grid that is evenly spaced you've moved up through risk now i've got a more realistic map now not everybody gets the same number of pieces and we you know change the the way those things interact We've moved beyond that to Axis and Allies, and now there's lots of different kinds of pieces, and you have to manage the production of them, not just the use of them. And so you can see that we can have a game uh, of the same basic concept that moves from very abstract up to far more realistic. So, training and learning, new concepts can happen in a very abstracted setting. An example of that we mentioned earlier, vocabulary. When you're learning a foreign language, you're simply trying to learn words. What does this word mean in that language? And so these are very isolated skills. I just want to know what the verb is. I'm not worried about what tense it exists in. I'm not worried about trying to conjugate it. I'm not worried about the gender of the nouns. I just want to know what the word is. And so you, you are learning individual words in isolation with each other. You're learning individual tasks in isolation from each other. Whereas training, you're going to incorporate those skills in context. And so you think about a foreign language. I know the words. Now when it's time to use the words, I'm now constructing sentences. And so now grammar matters. Now I'm training the use of those words, and I've got to string multiples together. I've got to use them in an appropriate context. When uh, I've got individual tasks, I now may have some mutual overlapping and supporting skills. I may need to engage in some critical reasoning to select from multiple available skills to pick and choose the appropriate one for the tasks in front of me. An example of training versus learning in the EMS world, the police, uh, emergency management kind of folks, as well as in the military, there's a lot of very specialized language and specialized skills that go with uh, speaking on radios. When you're on a radio network, you have specific terminology you have to know. You may have specific requirements for how to set up and dial into a radio network. In the EMS world, everybody's just on open networks because the whole point is to be able to talk to each other. In the military, you also have frequency hopping radios that all jump frequencies in the same sequence so that you can keep anybody, you know, the bad guys from listening in on you. And so there are a variety of skills involved with getting on the radio. One of them is, do you know the phonetic alphabet? Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. So you, you've got to know that. You may have to know radio codes for certain meanings for things. Uh, that's especially big in the police and EMS world. You may have to install a radio or set up a radio a certain way, particularly if you've got to hook it into a vehicle antenna. And then, in the case of the military, you may have to turn on your frequency hopping connection to get on the right radio network and then ask to join the radio network. So there's, there's a bunch of different things that I can teach each one of those to you individually as you're learning new concepts. But then when it comes time to train the use of the radio, I've got to string multiple skills together. So now I've got to make sure the batteries are in or that it's hooked into the vehicle set correctly and hooked into the right antenna. I've got to authenticate myself on the radio. I've got to be able to speak and give, you know, send and receive the appropriate kinds of messages. That's a bunch of different skills in the context of their actual use. And so as we talk about moving learning from those abstracted settings to training in a more complex setting, we're really looking at moving from not just abstract competitive types of game environments, but we're moving up into the training world where we're getting more realistic, which moves us up on that continuum towards more higher fidelity simulations. But we may move away from more competitive environments to non-competitive environments simply because there's too many factors to account for in, in those levels of competition. But at that point, competition may not be necessary to help reinforce the learning effects that we're after. So uh, the National Defense University actually kind of stole that idea, that, that grid that I had, um, and, and we're talking about some of their different kinds of exercises that they use. And one of the things that they added to this was the idea of the abstract non-competitive event. 
and they call these things tabletop exercises. It's almost sort of a rehearsal with everybody involved around a map. And a great example of that would be sort of the St. Patrick's Day parade through your town, right? So we've got police guys got to be closing uh, streets so that the parade route is available, and they may have to direct traffic to certain parking areas. But you also need to close the areas where you're going to be marshalling the parade floats. And then you've got to have a way at the end of the parade to get the floats out of the way so they don't all stack up in the same spot. Your EMS folks, the fire trucks and, and ambulance folks, need to know where to set up their medical checkpoints along the route. But they also need to know where the route is in case they've got to cross the route if an emergency comes up. So that is another factor that you would want to discuss on a tabletop exercise. So this is where you get everybody around a map together. You may get a bunch of matchbox cars on the map if you need to. And you actually talk over this tabletop exercise. Okay, at 6 o'clock the morning of the parade, who is doing what? Police guys, what are you doing? EMS guys, what are you doing? Parade organizers, what are you doing? Float guys, what are you doing? And you talk through this whole thing and you run through this whole exercise so that everybody knows end to end what they're supposed to be doing. As a part of those tabletop exercises, you can even throw some curveballs at them. Okay, guys, what do we do if a float breaks down? Well, we need to have these people here to move this float out of the way to do this. Police guys got to open a barricade to pull him off the route. Then we got to close that back up, get the rest of the floats going through. There's all of those discussions you have in a very abstract environment and a very non-competitive environment. Now, we don't often use those things in a classroom type environment, in a learning or training environment, but they're a useful tool in the professional world, and so that's why the NDU guys wanted to make sure they accounted for it on uh, on their grid. So, at the professional level, uh, there are similar continuums of realism versus competitiveness, but there's a different application of those labels based on their kinds of uses, and they incorporate this new concept of the tabletop exercise. And so it's a familiarization tool. We're not really trying to learn something new. We're not really practicing existing skills because they're completely out of context in a very abstract environment. But it's an opportunity to talk through the way certain things would happen so that the people that have to go execute are ready to do so. So, let's get back to our model of training versus learning on our games and simulations grid. We're not the only ones to notice that these kinds of theoretical backgrounds might apply in these areas. Uh, Greitzer, Kushar, and Houston, uh, a while back, proposed a similar two-axis model where they're looking for that optimal zone for motivation and learning. They want to keep people motivated in what they're learning. And, and so the ability or level of learning has to be matched by the difficulty of the game that you're putting in front of them. You don't want the game difficulty to exceed the ability of the player to, to respond to it and succeed in it, but you don't want it so easy that they just completely lose interest. Similar, uh, a similar concept to this was proposed by, look, I, I can never pronounce this guy's name right, right? System of highly, I, I'm going to butcher it. Like, it doesn't matter. I, I can't pronounce it. I can barely spell it. Thank goodness for cut and paste. But he's the godfather of flow. And when you start talking about people that understand what flow is, whether it's video games, whether it's, you know, driving race cars, whatever it is, there is this flow channel in which the participant's ability is appropriately matched to the challenge in front of them that enhances the level of immersion in the activity. And that if the challenge is too high for the level of skill, uh, you're, you're going to get an anxious participant. There's going to be a high level of frustration. Whereas if the skill is too high for a low-level challenge, they're just going to get bored and just not, not really enjoy it and lose immersion in there. So as we look at our graph that's moving folks from an abstract competitive learning environment to a more realistic non-competitive training environment, we also have to consider that that optimal state of flow and that zone of learning and motivation shows us that player, as player skill goes up, the difficulty of the game needs to go up. And one way to make the game more difficult is to increase the level of realism, the number of factors that we are attempting to account for. But at a certain point, we move out of that competitive game environment and into more of a non-competitive simulation environment where we're focused on process and context and not scorekeeping.
And that's okay because that's the kind of maturation we want in our learners as they move from learning into doing. So what does all this mean? Greater levels of ability allow for greater levels of complexity in the games we use. As people get better at stuff, we can throw them more curveballs, we can add more factors for them to account for. There's a higher level of realism in the challenges we want to put in front of them. Those greater levels of complexity don't necessarily require a game. At that point, we don't have to keep score. The participants are going to require an increase in difficulty based on their, their increasing skill level, just so we don't keep them bored. Right? But also to appropriately target it so that we minimize the anxiety and frustration on the part of the participants. So that's what we're looking at when we start talking about moving folks from learning up to training as we move from less competitive to more competitive and from more abstract to more realistic training stimulus. So some uses for games and learning and training, what are we actually doing with them? Most common uses, like we've said, learning is new skill acquisition and training is existing skill rehearsal. And so an example of that, in a learning environment, we're doing a quiz show. Right? That's not really the, the that's an isolated skill right there. That is recall of vocabulary or concepts or terminology. Unless you're auditioning for Jeopardy, the ability to respond well in a quiz show is not a very realistic stimulus but it works for maintaining interest and motivation on the part of the participants over there on that left side to get the juices flowing, to get them paying attention to what you're doing, and to help with recall of those, those learning concepts. Whereas training, we've got a more complex environment. We may have things in a specific context. You need to do things in a specific sequence. With CPR, you've got the ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. We, we've got to check these things. And let's check them on the crash test dummy before we got to do it on a real person. Let's make sure that when we're doing chest compressions, we're putting them in the right place. We're not just describing or answering a quiz question about, you know, five at a time and then this, or ten at a time and then this. Like, we actually do it. We've got the opportunity to execute it. And we may have other people there with us doing the breathing while we're doing the compressions or checking circulation and pulse while we're doing something else. So you, you've got that training piece in context that involves a variety of skills that you have to execute. Another common use for games and learning and training is the ability to explore decision making uh, from your participants through either role playing or recreating historical events in context. This is a big deal in the social science world. And, and a lot of the examples I'm going to give you are from that social science world because that's where my background is. But this gives us the ability to explore some of those decisions that people had made by putting the decision making in context. And so, for example, you've got a role-playing event in the model UN. Folks are out there pretending to be Malaysia or Israel or Brazil or whoever, and, and they are attempting to portray those roles to the best of their ability. You may give folks particular injects into the exercise or particular kind of secret missions almost that say, your goal is this within the context of our model UN. And so they've got specific objectives they are trying to achieve that puts them in a specific context that gives them the opportunity to look at some decision making. You can also put folks in a historical context. This is a board game of the war in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. And so you've got four player roles in this game. You've got the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the, the Americans and other allied nations, and the Viet Cong. And this gives you the opportunity to explore the kinds of decisions that each of those roles made throughout the course of the war, reacting to specific events, reacting to each other. How did the U.S. and the South Vietnamese make decisions when reacting to each other throughout the, the course of the war, or in this case, the course of the game? A great example of exploring that historical decision-making actually came out of one of the military war colleges, in which, uh, look, you read the histories of the Peloponnesian Wars, and in the middle of the Peloponnesian Wars, one of the participants sails off and goes and attacks Sicily. Right? They, they go and they ransack Syracuse, and they, they, they're conquering somebody in completely the wrong direction. And you're reading the book, and you're scratching your head, and you go, what the hell are these guys doing? You're trying to figure out what, what's actually going on. Well, then when you sit down to play the game, 
and suddenly you've got to feed all of your armies to keep them in the field, and your options are, I don't have enough food for the army, I either reduce the size of the army or I increase the size of the food supply. I don't want to reduce the size of the army, I'll lose the war. I've got to add more food. Oh, hey, look, there's a ton of wheat fields over by Syracuse and Sicily. Now suddenly it makes sense why you've got an army sailing in the wrong direction to go attack Sicily, secure the wheat fields, come back with a greater food supply, and keep a larger army in the field. That decision-making placed in a historical context suddenly makes a whole lot more sense. And when you face those, those participants with those choices, those actual historical choices in context, now you get to see those, those decision-making wheels turn. And they get an opportunity to explore the kinds of decision-making that people do in those same sorts of events. Now... That's not the only kind of decision-making that we can look at with games and learning and training. We can also support decision-making through our games and sims. We can test courses of action. We can test processes. Let's come up with a new way to construct the bridge and then use a simulation to test how strong it's going to be based on the amount of traffic we expect to be coming over it. It allows comparisons to tweak those conditions. If I build the bridge out of this kind of metal versus this kind of metal, what happens to my cost? What happens to my durability? What happens to my weight load? All these different things that we can explore to help support the decision making of where do I build the bridge? What kind of material do I use to build the bridge? When do I build it? How much is it going to cost? It lets our participants explore all these different kinds of options. This can also get referred to as hypothesis testing. And so we're testing different hypotheses to find the best condition that we want to decide on moving forward. A place where you will see this, the military uses this all the time to support different courses of action in an operation. Hey, I got to go take that hill. Well, do I want to encircle the hill? Do I want to just charge right up the middle? What if I swap this asset out for another asset? What if I take away some infantry and add some tanks? There's all kinds of different courses of action I can pursue in order to accomplish this mission. Let me test my way through several of these things to figure out which one I want to use before I go charge up the hill. So that's an example of how you can support decision making through the playing of a game or simulating a course of action and comparing it to others. Something that's very rarely discussed in the uses of games and learning and training is using the game right up front Let's use this as the introduction to new material. Let's build some interest in the material by diving right in. Let's allow the instructors to gauge the existing knowledge of the participants that I've got as, and, and the expertise that they might already be bringing to the table. This isn't a use you will find very helpful at the high school level, but at the college level, particularly if you've got adult learners returning to college and not just a bunch of you know, 19, 20-year-old uh, you know, traditional college students, but you've got folks with practical real-world experience, this may be a way to, to gauge what level of experience they're bringing into the game. And then th this game, especially if you get it right up front, this gives everybody a shared experience and a common reference point you can use for lessons down the line because now everybody has something that they've all been a part of together that you can use to talk back to couple of examples of this, and these are in the real-world professional realm. There, there's a board game, a tabletop game called Aftershock that looks at the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief community response to an earthquake on an island nation. And it's loosely modeled on the Haiti earthquake from some years back, but this looks at different player roles of the local government, of the relief agencies and NGOs, of the military and, and security sector, right, the police forces. It looks at, um, you know, an outside agency like the, or an outside country like the U.S. coming in to provide aid. And so do I spend time repairing the port so I can bring more aid in faster, or am I repairing roads to get aid distributed quicker? There's a variety of different participant choices throughout the game that these guys have to face. And, and this gives you the opportunity to throw that out there right up front to get a sense of what do people already know about humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. What, based on the actions we took in that game, when I'm talking about lessons later in the course or identifying particular needs where I may need to better focus my training, this gives me an opportunity to assess those things up front. Similarly, the gemstone game 
at the National Defense University. Um, this was for the Combating Terrorism Fellowship fa program. The first thing, it looked, it, they'd come in, the students would come in, they'd get all their books, get their housing assignments, get some, you know, a tour of the classroom buildings and everything. And then the first thing they did was spend a week playing the gemstone games that they were attempting to manage a counterinsurgency at the national level um, where they had to keep the counterinsurgency, support for the insurgency as low as possible while supporting the national government. And this gave all of the participants an event that they all did together so that it gave the instructors with a very international student body in front of them uh, something that everybody had been a part of that they could always refer back to and say, hey, remember when this happened in the game? Well, here's what, what we can look at going forward. Hey, we forgot one. What if we use games as an introduction to each other? Team building, partner building. Let's just do some personal introductions with one of these game events. Let's let our classmates get to know each other a little bit. Now, this is tough to do with a really small group. Um, because when the group's too small, it takes like five minutes to go through and make introductions and off you go. If it's too big, then you really only get to learn, you know, a couple of people right there in the group around you. Um, but especially if you've got the initial class in a sequence of classes, something like nursing school, where everybody's going to be together for the next two years, or in grad school when I was at the University of South Carolina, there was the, the one of the journalism programs that we had there, uh, you had a principles and a concepts and a campaigns and sort of, so there was this three course sequence that ran over fall semester, spring semester into the summer that you were with the same people for, you know, a year and change there together as you went through these classes. And so this, you know, a, a game like this might give you the opportunity to introduce each other, which isn't a bad way to start off a, a, a sequence and a program there where you can use these things. So. How do we decide what we're going to play, and how do we pick the right tool for the task? Well, there's a couple of other agencies that have tackled some ideas around this, and let's take a look at a couple of those. So what are we trying to learn or train? And so when we're, fo when we're looking at learning, when we're looking at that new skill acquisition, there are specific right answers that we are expected to be able to recall. Four plus four is still eight, no matter what. This word in this language means this thing, no matter what. These kinds of acronyms and abbreviations or radio code words or whatever they may be have specific right answers and specific wrong answers. Do the players know the right answers? And what's the feedback you're providing to the player when they give you the right answer or the wrong answer? Whereas training, I'm more focused on what's the right process. How do I take all of those individual skills and put them in the appropriate context does sequence matter within the process? And if so, how do I make sure that we're getting the sequences right in that process? Do all of the players know the right processes? Where do they fit into those processes? One of the things you find very quickly as you move from learning individual skills to training skills is that they go from individual tasks to collective tasks. Now I may need to have four different people all doing different things at the same time to make something work correctly. And so what kind of feedback am I giving the players based on their decisions in a training type environment as opposed to a learning environment? Learning, it's very easy to just throw a scoreboard up there, right? You get the right answer, here's your high score. Whereas training, if I'm depending on a variety of people to make sure we get the process right, there may not necessarily be a great way to score those things. So are we focused on the decisions that we want the players to make, right? So what are the decisions we want them to make, and are we rewarding the correct decision-making, as opposed to are we process-focused? And so what are the decisions we want the participants to make within the process? Are they at the right step of the process? Are they doing the right things within the process, right? And how do we keep the participants focused on winning instead, or focused on the process instead of focused on winning? And that may be one of the reasons why you remove the scorekeeping mechanisms as you move from learning to training, and you move away from games, increase the realism, but cut down on the scorekeeping because you're more worried about getting the process right than you are about just trying to get the score up as high as you can. The Ohio Department of Health used to categorize simple versus complex things where simple ones were very clear outcomes. They are very individualized tasks and they are very outcome oriented, whereas the more complex ones may be far more process focused. 
And so an example of that, if you're doing immunizations, at the simple level, the individual needs to use the alcohol swab to clean the injection site, stick the needle in, properly dispose the needle in the little biohazard container. There are very, you know, put the Band-Aid on. There are specific simple steps for a very clear outcome of yes, correctly injected or not. Whereas on the complex side, those more vague outcomes that are more process focused would be the setting up of the immunization clinic. Do I have the appropriate intake where I'm assessing who needs to get immunized for what based on prior immunizations, whatever records may exist? Am I moving people through at a consistent and smooth flow? Do I have nurses in the right places to be doing injections versus sticking them on paperwork? Am I able to dispose of not individual syringes and biohazard containers, but now I've got 14 biohazard containers. What do I do with those? Who takes over the disposal of those things? And so those known tasks that we are training are now part of a more complex process that the entire collective needs to help, uh, needs to help overcome. At the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, they, have, they actually have a variety of different games and sims available to them, and they help pick which sim they are using for their exercises based on whether or not they're training decision-making or processes, and also whether they're focused on short versus long-term uh, engagement that they're trying to train. And so an example of that short-term engagement in the military is somewhere 24 to 48 up to about 96 hours at the most where you're fighting a battle. This is an individual battle. Whereas a long-term focus, you're looking at six months, a year, 18 months. These are far more long-term campaigns over the course of a much wider, it, it, it's a much wider area, much wider scope of operations. And so if we're doing decision-focused training, on a short-term uh, major combat operations, that's what the MCO on there is, we're focused on commanders making the right decisions in combat. The game we're going to use is TAC Ops. Where if we're focused on commanders making the right decisions over a far more long-term engagement like a counterinsurgency, then the game we're going to use is called Urban Sim. If we're looking at process-focused things, now we're getting the staff involved. We want to make sure the staff understands how to provide all of the appropriate outputs through their process to their commanders. And so in a short term, we're going to use a Janus exercise or something like decisive action. And so that, that's sort of how you decide what it is you're trying to train. Let's pick the right game for what we're trying to train. Now, all this sounds like a lot of work. Isn't this supposed to be fun? All right, so mandatory quote number two. How do you make a game fun? Simple. Design a game, you take out everything that isn't fun. Sid Meier is the, uh, the godfather of the Civilization series of video games. There's been board games based on those. Uh, he also did Colonization. He's done some space games. Uh, but Sid builds big, expansive, epic sorts of games. And, uh, and, and he's been widely discussed and cited as sort of one of those game theorist types. All right, so let's define fun. I don't know. How would you define fun? Like, I don't necessarily have an answer, but... But we've all got different ideas of what fun might be. But is fun necessarily what we're after? Right? Games in the classroom can absolutely provide a break from that normal rhythm of class. But are we necessarily after fun or are we just after some novelty just to break up the monotony of Ben Stein up there talking about Holly Smoot tariff, you know, drawing on the chalkboard over and over? Is this just another way to keep participants engaged by breaking up what we're doing? And, and there are times when... You may do something that's not a game or a sim, but just gets the people up moving around in the classroom just for the sake of the novelty of it all. And that's totally cool. Uh, but are we necessarily looking for fun? Or are we just trying to, to break something up? And so if this isn't the primary goal, if we're not doing this just to have a laugh about it all, then how far away from fun are we willing to go to use games in the classroom? And that's an important decision that you need to keep in mind before you start introducing games or sims into your training and learning environments. And so we're looking at gaining and maintaining attention. Let's, let's think of these considerations, right? Is this fun? Are we enjoying this? How much are we having to work at this versus how much are we getting out of it for a learning effect or, or a training effect? Um, is there a competition piece involved? What are the stakes in, in our competition here? Are grades on the line based on your performance in the game or the sim? 
there's a variety factor to this and a novelty factor. How far outside the norm is this and is this something we've done before? There's also a relevance. How do we tie this into what we're supposed to be learning? And this goes back to the, the issue of decisions um, and process. Are we trying to train making right decisions? Are we trying to train a process? Are we learning new concepts? Are we training existing things that we already know how to do? There's also the idea of secondary learning effects. And so this may be a case where you introduce a game just for some novelty in the class, and there's not necessarily a direct tie to a specific learning objective. That's okay, because there are secondary learning effects that folks are still going to pick up from that. It's also something known as informal learning. Mitchell and Saville Smith at the, uh, the UK's Learning Skills Development Agency picked up a lot of informal learning effects from game players in the course of their research. Examples of that include a lot of the historical learning that your role-playing and strategy gaming, your war gamers, pick up uh, over time. A lot of role-playing guys are very well-versed in history because they're reading historical uh, information about the Middle Ages or ancient Rome or you know ancient Japan because they're looking for source material that they can use to incorporate into their role-playing games. In strategy and conflict games, they're they're recreating the Battle of Waterloo, so they want to know some more about the Battle of Waterloo. There's things they're going to learn about that just through the playing of the game. Uh, folks able to calculate math skills, improve their math skills with odds-based games. Do you hit or do you stand on 14 playing blackjack based on what cards you may have already seen come up through the deck? Who knows? You know, the, does the fact that the guy next to you has 15 make a difference? Well, yeah, and so. Your, your odds-based games give you some math skills that you can start calculating in your head a little quicker. Something else to think about. Do we actually have to play them? This is something I don't think nearly enough people consider as a part of their classroom curriculum. But what if we do game design as an assignment? What if using game design, in order to build a game about a particular concept, I've got to be able to understand that concept. If I'm building a game about water management in a desert environment. I've got to understand how to do water management in a desert environment so that I'm rewarding the right kinds of decision making on the part of my players. And so it gives people the ability to demonstrate a mastery of that material and the ability to synthesize their concepts. Can I isolate a specific facet of this problem? Right? This definitely gets your students engaged with the material. Things you need to consider as a part of game design as an assignment. Are you going to have them do this in teams? Or are they going to do this solo? Each individual person do their own work. Uh, how much are you going to provide materials? And the materials provided becomes a really big issue if you're do talking anything at all digital, right? Because now you've got folks writing code, and that's far, far more challenging than just getting out of Sharpie and a bunch of index cards and, and a couple of big pieces of paper. Is this an in-class project or a homework project? Are we going to play this in class? How do we showcase them, and how are you going to grade them? Now, one very important thing to consider when we're talking about game design as an assignment is considering how much time this takes up. And as an example, uh, I, at a game camp a couple of summers ago, I did a summer camp for gamers based out of a game store, and one afternoon, their task was to design a game. I went to the dollar store. I blew about 20 bucks just on random pieces and parts. Bought a couple of decks of cards, some dominoes, some giant poster board, uh, some plastic coins, a couple of chess and checkers sets. So they had those pieces to work with. Just all kinds of different stuff that they could you know, sort of dump out and use for whatever. And, and their, their task by the end of the afternoon was to come up with a playable example of a game of some sort. And they broke into pairs to go work on it. Four hours later, they had some very rudimentary games, some good ideas, but these things were very rudimentary and pretty crude and not well refined. And so if we start talking about in-class versus homework, um, and, and these guys weren't having to demonstrate mastery of any sort of particular class lesson. This was just go come up with something that's fun. Right, squirrels trying to compete to steal nuts out of a bird feeder. There, there's not a lot of class tie in there, and four hours later, they still had just the bare bones of that. So when you start talking about the kinds of time it's going to take to get one of these things built, make sure you account for that in the lesson time that you have available. No, but game design as an assignment is a great way to get people engaged with the material and showcase what they know. All right, so some success stories. What are some uses of games for training and learning where we've seen folks do stuff well? Um, 
Oregon Trail, the 1980s era computer game, that Old West exploration there. It was very popular in schools in the 80s and early 90s, and it never seemed to matter what decision you made. At the end of it all, you have died of dysentery. Um, but it, it this goes back to putting people in a decision-making context that's appropriate at the time and place in history where they were doing that. And, and you learned a lot about the adversity and hardships that settlers faced traveling across the country in these wagon trains in the, in the 1800s where you could do everything right. You could miss the bad weather in the mountains. You could miss, you know, attacks from Native Americans. You could travel with all the right food. You're, you know, your water's still good. You don't get bogged down anywhere. And at the end of it all, you still end up dying of dysentery before you get where you're supposed to be going. Like it, 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 it was a chance to really learn the kinds of adversities and hardships that folks faced through an experiential learning. Another one, the idea of the game Twilight Struggle. This is a board game of the Cold War. It, for a long time, it was the highest rated game on BoardGameGeek.com. That may not be true anymore, but for a long time it was. Um, it, it's a recreation of the, 80, the, the Cold War from the 40s up through the 80s. It ends in 89, as you can see from the box cover there. Students are playing the roles of U.S. and USSR leaders through the course of the Cold War. And there's a lot of historical events that are brought into play. Sputnik going up right? Uh, border skirmishes between the Chinese and the Soviets. There's the uh, the Suez crisis of the 50s. There's lots of real world events that the players have to manage through the course of this game. And it's only a two player game. It's not necessarily that you would put two kids down at a table and have them play this game, but maybe have two teams of folks playing the game as both the Americans and the Soviets and, and working their way through what kinds of challenges were faced by them and the decision making they had to they had to go through at that time in historical context. One of the things we did for the National Security Agency, the analytical warfighting environment, this was an example of isolating some individual skills that the, the intel analysts there could use some pretty small casual games to train to focus on individualized skills uh, just for some, some basic training effects. And these things were, they were designed to be a little cartoonish. We didn't want them to seem too much like work. We wanted them to be sort of lighter, more fun kinds of environments. And so one of the games we had was Evil Associations. There's a tool that the professional intel community uses called an association matrix. You've got a half a dozen, eight, ten, whatever guys on this matrix. And you've got to try to figure out how they're all related to each other. So you'd have ten folks in the matrix and we would generate a bunch of random... Uh, phone call traffic between them. The problem is you can't translate. You don't have the time or the resources to translate every phone call between people. So where are you going to focus your efforts on what kind, which phone calls you want to have translated looking at those communication patterns? Try to figure out who's connected to who. And for example, tow truck drivers talk to taxi cab drivers all the time. And so the fact that a tow truck driver and taxi cab driver talk to each other every day at three o'clock in the afternoon isn't that big of a deal because you expect those kinds of connections. Same thing, like the, the fashion model and the photographer talk to each other all the time because they're professionally connected. And, and again, like I said, this was going to be a little cartoonish. But when you're trying to figure out which one of these guys is a terrorist and which one is a terrorist supporter, well, now you're looking at is the fashion model calling the tow truck driver at 3 o'clock in the morning every Tuesday. Well, hey, that's suspicious. Maybe that's when they regularly plan certain things to try to happen. And so those are the messages you want to translate, are those occasional sort of one-off kinds of calls. So it's a, it, it was an opportunity to build a game around a very specific thing, which was trying to identify communication patterns, and within those patterns try and figure out how this group of people were all connected to each other to identify which one was the terrorist. The Hammer Incorporated PR exercise from the University of South Carolina um, like this was created years before Justin Hammer was the bad guy in the second Iron Man movie. <clears throat> but the name of the company was around the fact that they built industrial tool presses or something. I don't remember exactly how we how we structured it all. <clears throat> but it was focused around PR reactions to a big industrial accident. And so you had the participants in the classroom were divided into, you're the media guy, you're the PR guy, you're the PR guy for the city versus the PR guy for the company. Here's, you're the lawyer, right? 
you're the families who may have people that work there. You're the medical personnel and the, the PR guy at the hospital. And so the the initial thing that comes out is, hey, there's an industrial accident at this factory and people have been taken to the hospital and the factory's been shut down. And that's all we know. And so now, as the media guys, what kind of information are you trying to get? What are the PR guys giving you? What are the lawyers telling the PR guys they're allowed to give you? If you're family members, what are you able to find out? Are you calling hospitals? Are you getting stuff from the media? Are you getting stuff from the company? Is the company telling the family something different than what they're telling the media? This gives all of these different players an opportunity to role play in their different uh, discrete roles within the, this exercise. And then the exercise changed that last bullet. The scenario was updated throughout the class, uh, throughout the time in the class as this environment moved forward. So initially, all we have is there's an accident. Then there's a release from the hospital that somebody's died. Well, we don't know who, and we don't necessarily know how or how it may have been connected to what happened at the, the factory. But if you're the media guy and you find out who it is from the hospital, do you go public with that, not knowing if the family's been notified yet? If you're the company, what kind of statement do you make about the death? Do you acknowledge the death? Do you take responsibility for the death? There's all sorts of additional um, additional considerations that people have to take into account as they go through this exercise. And so that scenario continues to update throughout class, and everybody's got to react to what's being uh, shown up on the screen as it changes. So again, this is a very low-tech way in which you can inject this kind of role-playing exercise into a class where people get to practice and, and interact with some decision-making in a real-world context. All this was was a series of about a dozen or so PowerPoint slides that just rotated over every five minutes or so over the course, or maybe it was ten minutes over the course of a two-hour class that gave everybody the opportunity to react to some stuff. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? How are you going to go about doing it? The gemstone exercise, you saw this further up in the presentation. This was at the Center for Applied Strategic Learning at the National Defense University. This was the kickoff game for the International Counterterrorism Fellows. And so, first week of class, here you are playing this game. You're going to spend a week trying to tamp down an insurgency in Colombia or the Philippines or Thailand or wherever it was. And the, the students in these classes were not college students. These were senior government officials and again, it was the ICTF, so most of these folks were international students. Out of a room of 80 or so people, you'd have maybe a dozen Americans in there. So it, it gave everybody an opportunity to sort of get to know each other a little bit, but it also gave the faculty the ability to understand how much expertise everyone was bringing to the table based on their 20 or 30 years in their own country's government or military. And so what do my participants already know? What are they good at? What do we need to help train more of? What are the kinds of things they understand and what are the kinds of things we need to reinforce? But then also, over the course of the next year, everybody had this insurgency exercise to refer back to as a part of their, their lesson shaping. And so to that end, the faculty had this model that we helped them build. This was the model that the, the participants had to sort of work through. Now, they didn't get to see this bowl of spaghetti. We didn't show them this until the last day of the class. All of those blue inputs on the right side. Those were the things that the players were responsible for managing. Where are you spending your government money and what kind of story are you telling as a part of the spending of that money? And and there was a live, living, breathing, opposing force on the other side that were playing the insurgency. They had the red inputs on the, on the left side of the model. And what you were trying to do was change the three things in the middle there in the boxes, the support for the insurgency, the neutral population, and the support for the government. And so as the government went through their different activities, did their, so the support for the government go up or down throughout the course of the exercise? That's what they were trying to change. And it, it's, it's a difficult thing to manage, but this is very reflective of the real-world phenomenon out there that, that they were in that school to learn about. And so this gave them an opportunity to really engage with that material right up front. Uh, this lost at sea exercise, this had absolutely nothing to do with what we were teaching the kids in class. This was straight up one of those get to know you sorts of exercises. Used it at Wake Tech. It was a team building introduction thing. The class was sort of a welcome to college kind of class. It was it was a academic career success sort of class. And so one of the first things you walk in before you even take role. All right, is there anybody sitting in here 
next to somebody you already know. Okay, you two people, trade seats. All right, get in groups of five. Here's your worksheet. Um, you're in, in the scenarios up on the up on the big screen. Uh, you're on a boat. The boat is sinking. You've got about five minutes to grab a handful of supplies onto your life raft. What do you grab first, and why? What is what are the things you're prioritizing? And look, there's no direct tie into anything else that was happening in material. It just gave the chance for the students to kind of get to know each other a little bit, talk about things a little bit, see how good they were at surviving a shipwreck, and what did they prioritize and why. And and you know, we did this before we'd even take role in the class. We just hand this out, let them get started. And then we'd take role afterwards once everybody was engaged in the in the material. Um, so you know that was one of the first things we did. Did you survive the shipwreck? Who knows? All right. So some best practices. We've talked about a couple of success stories, but here are some best practices for you to keep in mind as you are uh, looking to integrate some games or sims into your training and learning environments. One of the key things in all of this is the instructor needs to be the one operating the game. The players are going to make the decisions, but don't hand the players a rule book and say, all right, here, figure out what you need to do next. The instructor operates the game. You adjudicate all the decisions. If you're playing Twilight Struggle, you give the kids the three different cards that have the events on them that are in their hand for that turn. Hey, which one of these three things do you want to do this turn? Do you want to increase international aid to certain countries somewhere do you want to trigger this event, right, the U.S. invades Vietnam or whatever it may be? Do you want to make these certain things happen? Have them decide which thing they're going to do, and then you go move the, the game board around. You update the scoring. You do all of the things that require an interaction with the rules. Don't give the players a rule book. You make the moves according to rules. You tell them what happened, but keep them focused on the decision right in front of them, not on them trying to do the math in their head of, Oh well, hey, if we do this, then this score goes this way, and it'll screw them this way. And don't don't do any of that. Give them some historical decisions and let them do it. Um, for history-based games, let's go back and compare the decisions to history. Hey, you guys did X. In reality, Y happened. Why do you think that happened? Um, what decisions were made at the time? Hey, you guys did X because you've got the benefit of fifty years of hindsight to look back and go, yeah, that was kind of dumb. We shouldn't have done that. But at the time, people were making the decisions. Right? How did the Cuban Missile Crisis go down? Well, why? Based on the information they had at that point in time. Um, so compare those decisions to history. See what they come up with. Are you going to do opposed teams or cooperative gameplay? There's no right answer here. But you do need to take into account the, the interpersonal dynamics of who's in your, who's in your group that you're, you're doing this with. And so you can do things very cooperatively. Either the group against you as the instructor or... Use other sections of that same class as opponents. So again, if we go back to something like Twilight Struggle, you've got uh, period one versus period three. And so one are the Russians and three are the Americans. And let them run through that game head to head with, again, you making the, the adjudications of all the moves as the, the day goes on. And so this gives you the opportunity to explore. Maybe there's a cooperative model of the group as a whole making some decisions and interacting with whatever those games are. Um, another thing that has succeeded in some places and not in others, but, but can succeed very well if you've got multiple games to integrate and you are thoughtful about how you set it up ahead of time, is scoring over the length of the entire term. Are you going to keep teams consistent or are you going to shuffle the teams around throughout the term? How are you going to even those scores out across the term so that they're they're fairly normalized? Are you going to use some Z-scores, or, or how would you convert those things to sort of normalize across time? But scoring over the length of the term can be uh, a useful motivator to keep people engaged throughout the, the length of the course. All right, some additional resources to consider. Uh, Pack Sims is a blog on serious games that focuses on sort of politics, defense, security stuff. Uh, it's run by Dr. Rex Brynan. He's a poli sci professor up in Canada. He was the designer behind Aftershock. Um, again, heavy social science, defense, and security emphasis here, partly because that's that's my field of expertise. That's sort of what I know. Uh, but but Rex has a lot of great resources there in the professional development space and the university space. Some things appropriate for high schools, not everything. Uh, board Game Geek is the largest board game site of players out there on the web. 
very active forum area, including a very active area dedicated to teaching with games, and all the way down to the elementary school level. Most of what we've discussed today is appropriate for high school and college level folks, as well as professional development. Uh, but Board Game Geek's discussion areas of, of classroom uses of games in classrooms goes through middle school all the way down to elementary school. And they've there are a lot of great smart participants willing to jump in and help out folks asking questions. There's also a huge repository of games in their database where you can look at the rules ahead of time. You can look at what the components look like. Hey, this game sounds really cool. Let me take a look at the picture. Oh crap, that board is way too big for me to set up anywhere. I'm gonna have to find something different. Or hey, there's a lot of pieces and parts I could lose something. So this gives you the opportunity to examine the games the, with some detailed photographs before you make a decision on what to do. There's also Alan Emmerich. If you're looking at uh, using game design as a course tool to, to have your participants actually design games, Alan teaches game design. I, I'm pretty sure he's still at the Art Institute in California, but Alan teaches game design and has a lot of good resources on his website for getting folks started, what kinds of components they can consider, what kinds of levels of complexity you can expect in these assignments. And then also over at the Armchair Dragoons, which is my site, and, and you've seen the little logo down the bottom left corner this whole time, the Armchair Dragoons, had, we've got a game bibliography there that is focused primarily on games and learning, um, but also on some motivation factors and some, some self-efficacy factors. Um, so we're looking at, at the uses of games and interactivity and learning and its effects on intrinsic motivation. And so this is this is just the research bibliography, lots of citations there, but lots of ideas of things that you can go grab uh, in your own research as you're starting to, to build your own toolbox of games in the, uh, in the classroom. So to wrap all this up, learning and training are not the same thing, right? They're not. We're, one is new skill acquisition, one is the uses of existing skills, whether you stick with the vocabulary I've proposed for this presentation or not, doesn't matter. Um, your learning and training need to be distinguished separately because you need to approach them differently as you're assessing whether what kinds of games and simulation tools to use when you're learning or training. Games and sims can be the same, but they might not be the same, and that's okay. Um, it, it's up to you to decide the right tool for the learning effects that you're after. You need to clearly identify the reason you're using the game or simulation. You need to answer that why question. You don't necessarily have to tie into a specific task or function, but you do need to clearly articulate what that objective is. Maybe the objective is to simply provide historical context for decision making. Maybe it's just to get kids out of the chairs and moving around the room. Whatever it is, you need to clearly articulate what that objective is. Don't be afraid to steal good ideas from other people. Right? Lots of folks have really great ideas on the uses of games and sims in the classrooms um, or, or in other training environments, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Go, go steal somebody else's idea for the wheel. It's totally okay. Don't be afraid to think outside the box, though, and don't be afraid to come back to your classroom and say, hey, we're going to try a game design project here. We're going to all design a game and see what we come up with. Because you may end up with something very rudimentary, like that Hammer Incorporated thing was just a, it was a PowerPoint slideshow, but it was all in the way the roles were assigned and the roles were briefed so that people had specific roles that they were expected to portray throughout the course of that exercise. The stimulus was just a rotating series of PowerPoint slides, but after that, everybody had, had a role to play and interact with each other as they reacted to those slides collectively. So don't be afraid to, to think outside the box on some of those things. Again, um, thanks for taking the time to watch this, to listen to this. Uh, come join us at the Armchair Dragoons. We've got an area set up for professional wargaming discussions. We've also got the, that game bibliography that you're welcome to pillage and plunder to your heart's content to try and find uh, some great information for yourself. Um, again, this is Brant. I appreciate you taking the time to, to watch this. And please stop by and let us know some of your success stories and tell us all about what you've done with Games and Sims in your training and learning environments.